Hello everyone and welcome to Amanpour & Company. Here's what's coming up. We are in a very critical time in this country right now. We've got to not walk away from the facts and the data. Christmas is coming and COVID is surging. California orders new stay-at-home rules. We talk to the state's Lieutenant Governor, Eleni Kunalakis. And our car was shot through all the tires and through the windscreen. Ugandan pop star turned opposition politician. Bobby Wine tells us why he's risking his life to unseat the president, running for another term after 35 years in power. Plus, flashback to this year's COVID epicenter. Watch the panic and fear inside a Wuhan hospital. Co-director of the new documentary, 76 Days, How Wu talks to our Hari Srinivasan about chronicling the lockdown. Amanpour & Company is made possible by the Anderson Family Fund, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Candace King Weir, the Strauss Family Foundation, Bernard and Denise Schwartz, Charles Rosenblum, Jeffrey Katz and Beth Rogers. Additional support provided by these funders and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiane Amanpour in London. This is what hope looks like, one of the first batches of the COVID vaccine being offloaded at a hospital near London. British authorities approved the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine last week, and the FDA in the United States is set to do the same this week. But still, Dr. Fauci is worried. Until enough doses eventually really reach enough people, he's worried about Christmas and New Year, holidays which he says could bring about an even bigger COVID spike than the one after Thanksgiving. From coast to coast, COVID is still spreading out of control. Tens of millions of people in California woke up this morning to strict new stay-at-home orders after the state reported its highest daily caseload yet. ICU beds are quickly filling up there, and doctors and nurses are yet again feeling the crushing pressure of trying to keep patients alive. Here's California's governor, Gavin Newsom, issuing the latest orders. The bottom line is if we don't act now, our hospital system will be overwhelmed. If we don't act now, we'll continue to see a death rate climb, more lives lost. Now, Eleni Kunalakis is the state's lieutenant governor. She is the first female ever to hold that role. And one of her earliest endorsements came from her friend, Kamala Harris. And her name has even been floated to fill Harris's Senate seat, now that she'll be vice president. Kunalakis joined me from Sacramento to speak about the health emergency. Lieutenant Governor, welcome back to the program. Great to be with you, Christiane. So it is a terrible situation that is engulfing so much of the United States. Awful records are being set, including in your own state. Tell me how severe and how strict this latest lockdown order is. Well, first of all, um, you're right. There is a surge nationally and there is a surge in California as well. But we anticipated that the numbers would go up in the winter. The nature of the virus is such that when people are in close quarters, it is far more likely to spread. So we knew this was coming. Um, and of course, we've been concerned all along that it would be uh, a very steep increase, and it has been. So if you look at just a month ago, our um, positivity rate of our testing was just over 3%. We're now over 10%. The number of uh, patients in our hospitals about a month ago was around 3,000. We're now at 10,000. So this is a very steep increase. And in fact, we're not sure, but we think that um, if there is a spike associated with Thanksgiving, those numbers are already uh, likely to grow. So what we have done is divide the state into five zones based on hospital capacity. We want to make sure that anybody who ends in the hospital and ends up in ICU is able to get the nursing care, able to get the ventilators if they need them, able to get what they need. And so looking at those ICU numbers is now what's driving, mm -hmm. turning the dimmer switch back and closing down some operations that have been open. And again, what we're looking at is getting through this, 
minimizing uh, the fatalities, uh, protecting our people, and of course, looking forward to, uh, to the spring when we hope that vaccines are going to be widely available. Well, just a quick one on, on the ICU beds. I understand there's quite a low capacity right now, right? 12.5%. That's not a huge number of beds available for COVID emergencies. So again, we've divided it up into five regions. We're 40 million people in the state of California. So San Francisco Bay Area, Sacramento, San Joaquin County, Northern California, north of those places, and then Southern California. Depending on which of the five zones you're in, hospital capacity varies. Mm -hmm. In two of those zones, in the San Joaquin Valley and in Southern California, there are fewer than 15% of hospital beds left. That's why those two regions have been mandated to have the closures. The Bay Area has taken it upon themselves in uh, several of the counties there to, to get in early. But that's the threshold. And again, because we haven't figured in yet, the impact of Thanksgiving gatherings, um, it may very well be that the other three remaining zones also need to go on lockdown. So you're talking about Thanksgiving, which, you know, obviously you all advise people to take it easy, don't travel so much, don't gather. Now you're coming up with Christmas. We'll discuss that in a moment. But this is what Dr. Fauci has said about the measures you're taking. I have been in discussion with the health authorities from the state of California who called me and asked, you know, they said, we feel we need to do this. What do you think? And I said, you know, you really don't have any choice. When you have the challenge to the healthcare system, you've got to do something like that. Lieutenant Governor, Dr. Fauci looks like he's not only agreeing, but supporting what you're doing, advising you to take those measures. But let's just, let's just talk about Californians and, frankly, the rest of the country who've been under these waves of restrictions and orders and advisements, you know, for the last nine months. And now you've got Christmas coming up. What frightens you about what's coming up? Well, I think part of what's difficult is that people are getting exhausted, they're getting lonely, um, and they just want it to be over. And so what we're trying to do is really call upon Californians to recognize that this is the most dangerous part of the entire pandemic. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. If we can get through this last period safely, we're going to be very quickly in a situation where, it, where we are going to be able to begin to minimize the presence of this virus in our communities through vaccinations. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're asking people, hold tight, hunker down. Now is not the time uh, to get tired of the precautions. Now is the time to really double down make sure that you and your family stay safe. And most importantly, Christian, you know, most of the infections uh, are among people among the ages of 18 to 35, but the fatalities are primarily people over 65. Mm -hmm. And we all have people over 65 in our lives who we love and we care about. And so a lot of this, frankly, is to minimize the spread so that our seniors don't catch this because they're the ones who are uh, most likely to be fatalities. Uh, and as a community, as a society, it is incumbent upon us to protect everyone. Let me talk to you now about the vaccines because you mentioned it several times. And frankly, I think everybody, individuals, uh, leaders such as yourself, the public health environment, they are really quite desperate for this to happen because you are demanding people to adjust their social behavior until these vaccines come on board. Now, we've had a lot of promises, we've had a lot of optimism, and now all of a sudden we're hearing people in charge saying, hang on a second, we promised, I don't know, 300 million by the end of this year doses, but actually it may only be, you know, a fraction of that because of manufacturer and delivery. Do you know, at all, when you as a state of California, for instance, will start getting doses of vaccines that you can roll out? So we are expecting delivery of the Pfizer vaccine, which has already been approved. We are expecting delivery of over 300,000 doses um, in the coming days, maybe weeks. And we have a plan to distribute that first and foremost to our healthcare workers. Secondly, the second priority is going to be to get the vaccine to people in congregate living, uh, senior centers, um, uh, skilled nursing facilities. But first and foremost, to get our healthcare workers vaccinated is our priority. Obviously, we need a lot more than 300,000 doses. So the second vaccine that we are waiting to hear um, whether it's going to be approved is the Moderna vaccine. 
once that happens, we do anticipate that we may have as many as 2 million doses before the end of the year. We are working, the governor and his team are working very diligently for a plan to make sure that those vaccines end up with the right people. Again, healthcare workers, number one, people in congregate living, uh, second. So beyond that, when we look into the new year, that's when we hope that we'll be able to get all of our uh, all of our healthcare workers vaccinated and start getting into more of the vulnerable populations. It's going to be a rollout. As you say, a lot can happen in terms of how many millions of doses are going to be ready and when. Um, but we're very encouraged. We're also very encouraged, frankly, about what appears to be on the, you know, through the trials, the effectiveness of these vaccines, over 90% effective. That is uh, very good news um, for, for Californians and for the country. Now, President Trump had promised 100 million doses by the end of the year. As you say, we'll see, we'll, we'll see whether that happens. Can I ask you, I don't want to sound churlish, but look, you know the president has been really on the attack against what he calls blue state governors, blue state authorities, blue states, basically saying that, you know, you're not doing it right and, and all the rest of it. And we're seeing that there's, you know, a lot of, of, of surge all over the place. And there have been some Democratic leaders who have violated their own rules. I mean, Governor Newsom, for instance, had a 12-person birthday party for a friend. We've got mayors in, um, like the San Francisco mayor, the mayor of San Jose, Senator Feinstein. I mean, Basically, some of these elected officials who are saying you have to do this have, to an extent, flouted various social distancing rules. How serious is that? Well, I think that the general public um, really is right to demand that elected officials and leaders practice what they preach and um, set the best possible example. People make mistakes. Uh, people have failings. We just have to continue to, in my opinion, make it clear that everybody knows how you catch the virus, how you keep safe from catching the virus. Nobody should want to catch this. And we know so much more about it today than we knew nine months ago. And as I said, we're so close mm -hmm. that if people can continue to follow these safety precautions, wear masks, social distance, stay away from other people um, as much as possible, then we will be able to get through what is, and you know, you know your history, Christiane, uh, this is a historic global pandemic. Nothing like this in a hundred years since the 1918 flu uh, that um, by some accounts was responsible for the death of 50 million people globally. Mm. We are doing the best that we can, but it is upon, it's incumbent upon everyone to know how to keep safe and to do their best to stop the spread. I want to ask you, because you used to be ambassador of the United States in Hungary, a, a country that's I guess euphemistically known as an illiberal democracy. In fact, they call themselves an illiberal democracy, you know, with some quite authoritarian, autocratic tendencies. When you see what your president of the United States has done in the aftermath of the election, wanting to stop the, the count, refusing to concede, uh, all the other things he's done, including right now, apparently not even engaging, he's still president for at least two more months on this pandemic. I'm just interested in how you compare him with some of these other leaders who you've, who you've encountered, particularly during your time in Hungary. Well, that's an interesting question. I, I think that I, from my perspective, this is how I see it. I think that people in democracy should demand leaders who care more about their country than they do about their own political skin or their own family's financial interests. That to me is the most important test. And that is a test that Donald Trump failed again and again. He lost this election and that he insists on going out and telling his supporters, no, no, it was taken from him. There's no evidence of this. And yet he is willing to do it, not because he cares about this country, but because he cares about his own skin. And it's real here in Sacramento, um, right, not, immediately now, but uh, over the weekend, and probably there will be more, there are people coming to demonstrate, saying the election was stolen from Donald Trump, counter protesters. We have to mobilize our, uh, our uh, 
uh, police forces to make sure that people don't um, get into these violent situations at a time when we all should be focused on this global pandemic and stopping the spread. It is incredibly unfortunate, um, but I'm very hopeful now. You know, it's uh, our daughter of California, Kamala Harris, is about to step in to the role of Vice President of the United States, the first woman ever in the top two positions in our country. We're incredibly proud of her. Uh, but she and, of course, President-elect Biden have a lot of work to do, uh, hopefully reminding Americans as to why government first and foremost should be there to look after their interests, the interests of the people. And just finally, because you mentioned it, um, she, Kamala Harris, is the first female vice president. You are the first female lieutenant governor of your state. Uh, do you think you will be uh, selected by the governor to step into her position as senator? Is that something you would like? Oh, my goodness. Uh, everyone is asking the governor. I don't I, I don't know what direction he's going to go. But we're very proud um, to have so many Californians now in this administration. It was just announced that our attorney general is going to has been tapped by uh, Vice President-elect Biden to be the new Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. So the way that we see it, California is science based. Uh, we, we listen to our people. We work together here in Sacramento. And if we are able to send leaders to Washington to show that, in fact, the California model of problem solving and serving the people is one that should be emulated in the country, that makes us all proud. All right. Well, good luck, because you're in for a rough ride at the moment with this COVID surge. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you so much, Christian. And there are many countries, including in Latin America, that are in for a very, very rough ride with this COVID surge, um, particularly other countries such as Brazil, which have populist leaders, and including Venezuela. It is one of those dealing very, very difficult with this COVID. It's on its knees economically even before the current pandemic. And the health crisis is testing the system to breaking point. Meantime, President Nicolas Maduro has just claimed victory in the country's legislative elections, which the opposition and the US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, has called a fraud and a sham. Maduro claims that COVID is under control, but correspondent Issa Suarez found a very different story on the ground in the capital, Caracas. In Los Magallanes Public Hospital in Caracas, remnants of this once wealthy nation lie strewn on the dirt floor. It's shackle wards hiding what the Venezuelan government doesn't want us to see. Here, COVID-19 has unmasked Venezuela's open wounds, and practically every floor of this hospital is empty tells me this hospital worker who prefers to remain anonymous. It's a risk only a few dare to take. This is the COVID-19 ward. Only this part of it is functional. The rest is completely run down after years of mismanagement. So it's no surprise many would rather face the pandemic outside these walls, choosing instead their homes over these decrepit rooms, where darkness has literally taken over. This is the intensive neonatal ward. And the reason I'm holding up this light right here is because there is no electricity in this hospital. Have a look around. Bare bones. And what I've been told by doctors around Caracas and outside of Caracas is that this is the situation day in, day out. Even in the morgue, death comes with shortages. There's no pathologist here, and with intermittent electricity, the stench is unbearable. Now imagine having to face a pandemic in these conditions. It's why doctors like Gustavo Villasmil are no longer afraid to speak out. I have friends of mine who have been criminally charged, he says. Why? For protesting the conditions in which they've been forced to practice. So he doesn't hold back. In Venezuela, he tells me, there are only as many recognized COVID cases as the regime wants. With testing limited to three government control labs, Villasmil says it's impossible to paint an accurate picture. With regards to COVID, he says, 
we don't know where we are. The government, however, claims the pandemic is under control, saying its strategy has worked. A government minder shows us inside a hotel where suspected infected patients are kept in quarantine for up to 21 days. It's a lockdown strategy employed by China, which the government of Nicolas Maduro has been keen to extol. Dr. Rodriguez shares a similar pride. Venezuelans have shown an immunity to the virus, he says. The families of those who have died on the front lines may see it differently. 272 healthcare workers have lost their lives in Venezuela as of November the 30th. At Hospital Vargas in Caracas, you can see why. They are overworked and unprotected. So it's one nurse for this whole area here. No tenemos tapabocas, no tenemos guantes. Este, el agua lo ponen una sola vez al día. O sea, una hora en la mañana, una, una hora en la tarde, una hora en la noche. Aquí no hay escobas, no hay mopas, no hay pañito. This is evident all around. And as I walk this ward, I stop to speak to a patient's daughter. She tells me her frail 69-year-old father is here because of malnourishment, the same state-imposed malady that we've seen across Venezuela. His immune system is compromised, yet he shares this ward with a COVID patient. His daughter tells me he needs iron supplements that the hospital simply doesn't have. Have a look at this. I mean, this is what, this is what they... They have to work with here, nurses and doctors, syringes, to standing. They've got nothing. There's a vast emptiness all around and a sense of disillusionment and surrender. Painful, no doubt, for those who saw this once oil-rich country as one of the wealthiest in Latin America, now tittering on the brink of survival. And we reached out to the Venezuelan government on the issues raised in this report. We have yet to receive a response. So now to another country, another continent, where democracy is under attack, and that's in Uganda. President Yaweri Museveni has been in power there longer than many Ugandans have been alive, nearly 35 years. In the beginning, Museveni won praise from the international community for bringing stability to that East African nation. But over time, he has tightened his grip on power, squashed the opposition, and cracked down on dissent. With elections due in January, Museveni is now facing an unlikely challenger, pop star turned politician of the people, Bobby Wine. So that's a little taste of his music. He was elected to parliament in 2017, and he says he's been tortured for his outspoken criticism of Museveni, and is now dodging death for daring to run for president. He was arrested last month, his car has been shot at, and he now wears a bulletproof vest to campaign. And Bobby Wine is joining us from the Ugandan capital, Kampala. Welcome to the program. Um, how difficult is it for you? I've just read a list, a litany, of the pressure you are under and the very real um, bullets that have been fired your way. Tell me why you're taking this risk. Thank you very much for having me, Christian. And pardon me if I look so space. Uh, I've just been uh, forced out of three districts tonight uh, where the police officers are not allowing me to sleep in those districts. Right now I'm in Arua and the only hotel that was willing to take me for the night is a hotel where my driver was shot dead and I also survived death on the 13th of August uh, in 2018. But I'm happy to be here. Uh, I am taking this risk because it is worth taking because nobody else is gonna do it other than we ourselves. And in any case, not taking the risk is even taking a bigger risk because nobody is safe. Those that stay home and keep silent about the enslavement and we who speak out. That is why I dare to represent my people in this struggle. So, you know, I said many people are, are you know, weren't even born when the president first came to power. In fact, 80 percent of the Ugandan people are under the age of 35, which is how long he, Museveni, has been in power. But what is it? that makes you believe that somebody who's held on to power for this number of years 
is ripe for, you know, for a challenge and, and potentially could be defeated by somebody such as yourself? Well, I was also four years when President Museveni took charge of our country. But like you mentioned, it, the biggest part of our population is under the age of 35. Precisely over 80% of our population is my age and below. These are the um, disconnected young people, the unemployed, the excluded. They, um, they have not. Our country has been divided into the haves and have nots. So these are the masses looking and searching for a difference, searching for better, searching for change, but most importantly, wanting to be free in their country, wanting their voice to be heard. That is the constituency that I am representing. What gives me confidence that we can overwhelm the dictatorship is the history, the recent history in Africa. Um, the young people did it in the Gambia. The young people did it in the Sudan. The young people have done it all through history. That is why I believe that if we stick by the law, if we come out massively and vote, we can be able to overwhelm the dictatorship of President Museveni and for the first time in our life also have a test of true freedom. So, look, I've interviewed the president several times. The last time was a few years ago, admittedly. But he insisted to me that the opposition is free to operate in his country. This is a little bit of what he said. The opposition in Uganda competes on a leveled playing field. There is no opposition which we stifle. We, but otherwise, we never restrain the opposition at all. So, level, level playing field, no restraint. Um, Bobby Wine, tell me... Apart from the very real danger, which is obviously, I guess, your overriding concern, are you able to campaign? Do you have access to the media? What are the issues um, that you're facing trying to mount a credible campaign? Well, it is funny for President Museveni to say there's a playing, a level playing field for the opposition. First of all, I was arrested on the day of nomination, on the nomination ground. I was beaten. Uh, paper sprayed and driven straight to my home. I have been blocked from using the main roads by the police and the military. Just tonight, I was denied uh, accommodation from three districts. And like I said, the only hotel that was willing to take me in is this hotel owned by my friend, mm -hmm. the same hotel where my driver was murdered two years ago. I am not allowed to speak on radio stations the military has literally taken over um, the, campaign pro the campaign process. I am not allowed to access any town. And whenever I try to campaign, I am driven in very, very remote areas where there are no people. Thanks to um, the uh, dynamics the way they are, because the people, especially young people, have had to walk miles and miles to access us. The only uh, media that I can be allowed on is social media. That is the only media that we have that we can use to communicate to our people. I, as you mentioned, I have to put on a bulletproof for me to be able to campaign. I have mm. survived two assassination attempts in the last two weeks where bullets have been shot in my car and on the tires and in the windscreen. Uh, tear gas canisters are thrown at us every time we are tear gas and brutalized and even shot with live bullets by the police and the military. Mm -hmm. That is the ground that President Museveni calls Lagos. Um, Bobby, let me ask you this because, um, you know, I, I just wonder whether you think the January election is going to be free and fair. And if not, what do you think the recourse is? You know, we've seen what happened in Belarus a few months ago. Uh, we saw the international community, the EU, you know, make some noises, but not a massive amount has happened there. We've got a new president and a new administration coming into the United States. Um, they say they're going to put human rights back, uh, certainly somewhere centrally in their foreign policy. What do you think the US, what are you calling on the United States to do? Because let's not forget, the president is a very close ally, has even visited the White House. Uh, first of all, I know that already the election is not free and fair. We are only going into this election as a protest vote. 
because we know that the people of Uganda, even amid this intimidation, even amid this harassment, they will come out and massively vote. And yes, I am sure they are going to vote out, out President Museveni because 35 years is just enough. My only plea to the United States and the entire uh, development community, the entire international community, all the development partners, we have always been calling upon them to put the observation of human rights and the rule of law as a precondition for cooperation here in Uganda. We know that the United States it has a very strong partnership in Uganda. <clears throat> we receive over $100 million a year to work with security. But again, this is the same money that is being used to murder people, to oppress Ugandans, and to abuse human rights. Just less than two, just over two weeks ago, more than 100 Ugandans were shot and killed for showing support for me for coming out to protest, and yet it is within the law to protest peacefully. We do not have any guns, we do not have any stones, but we are being attacked brutally by the police and the military that are armed to the teeth. People are being slaughtered every day by a president that takes pride in murdering people. Just the other week, President Museveni came out and confirmed that he indeed had ordered for the mass murder of people of Uganda. So we call upon the United States to put the rule of law and observation of human rights as a precondition to cooperation and to also call to order President Museveni, who seems not to listen to any other voice apart from the international community and precisely the United States of America. Mm. Um, just I'm just going to put their position before I head to another question. The government says that you were arrested and you've been, you know, well, I mean, I can say harassed. They say stopped because you're, quote, unquote, breaking COVID rules by campaigning. But I want to ask you this. Um, you call yourself or you're known as the ghetto president. Um, what is it that young Ugandans, the majority of the country, as we said, 80% of the country is under 35 years old, what are they yearning for there beyond the obvious freedom? What, what do they want for, their, for, for Uganda? Young Ugandans are yearning for freedom of speech, for freedom of expression. They're yearning for the basic human rights. They're yearning for the right to live. Young Ugandans are yearning for the opportunity to determine their destiny. It has been 35 years of stagnation. Young Ugandans feel like they are first world brains stuck in a third world country. And indeed, they believe that they don't live in a third world country. We only have third world leaders. We Young Ugandans are yearning for democracy. They're yearning for their voice to be heard. They want to speak and be heard. They want the right to determine their destiny. That is what young Ugandans are calling for. They want to live their full potential. They feel like they are not living their lives. They feel like they are being owned. They feel like they are being enslaved in the 21st century in their own land. They want democracy in the real sense of the word. It is, of course, extraordinary that 35 years ago, um, Museveni took part in the rebellion that brought down the dictator Idi Amin. Um, and here we are 35 years later. Let me just ask you very quickly and finally, are you afraid for talking to us, for making this international interview now? Well, yes and no. First of all, I am afraid because the majority of the people that have spoken out in Uganda have ended up dead or ended up in exile or in prison. So I expect the worst anytime. But again, I'm not feeling afraid because I know that the international media has, is one of the uh, factors that have kept me alive. I know that no matter how ferocious a dictator President Museven is, he is afraid of the international community. He knows how okay. all the dictators have ended up in the past. Well, you're, you're being very brave, Bobby Wine, and we hope to invite the president on to put some of these issues to him. Thank you very much for joining us.
And now we head a little further north to a crisis unfolding largely away from cameras. Refugees are fleeing Ethiopia into neighboring Sudan, saying that they were targeted for their Tigray ethnicity. The United Nations is demanding access to the refugees, and the African Union has been trying to broker a ceasefire. In this war between the Ethiopian government and the regional Tigray's People Liberation Front, fighters from neighboring Eritrea are also involved in what is a complex web of fighting. Our Nema El Bagia spent days gathering testimony from those who fled, and here is her report. The Sudan-Ethiopia border, the last leg in the journey to safety. In the first weeks of the conflict, thousands of refugees from Ethiopia's Tigray region crossed daily. Now the figures are dwindling day by day. Those that do make it here come bearing scars and testimony. This is Zerai Gabrigirchis. He says he fled the city of Shararu, near the Ethiopia-Eritrea border. He says the Eritrean soldiers beat them with machine guns, lay them on the ground and put weapons in their mouths. He says if you showed fear, they would kill you. But if you were brave, you escaped with your life and the scars on your back. This young man is also from Shararo, and he described the same scene. But asked that we not share his name. Like many here, he's still afraid. It's very hard to know what is happening in Ethiopia's Tigray region because the government has enforced a communications blackout. A CNN team at the Sudan-Ethiopia border spent days gathering testimony from refugees who say they were targeted because of their Tigray ethnicity. They're taking dangerous risks to find safety. <laughs> Fayuri arrived in Sudan with a newborn. Heavily pregnant when Humera was attacked by the Ethiopian army, Fayuri fled through back routes, giving birth in a field. She tells us only she and her mother-in-law made it to safety. We can't independently verify their accounts, but they all tell a similar story. The Ethiopian army enters the town, they say, tells civilians they're safe. Ethiopian soldiers leave, and then other armed groups arrive. A spokeswoman for the Ethiopian Prime Minister denies these claims and told CNN these refugees' testimonies are a result of the fear of the other propaganda the Tigray leadership had fed its people over the past three decades. The spokeswoman denied the existence of the Fanu Amhara militia, but simultaneously, confusingly, acknowledges the militia of the Amhara region were engaged to the extent of securing border towns between the two regions. Sudan is struggling economically post the ouster of former dictator Omar al-Bashir, and this influx of refugees has found little comfort on this side of the border. But at least it's somewhere safe. Neam al CNN, London. Correspondent Neema el Bagir there, and we are hoping to have the Ethiopian Prime Minister on our program very soon. From this country in the midst of ethnic warfare to a city that was the world's first COVID epicenter. When the virus overran Wuhan, the Chinese government imposed a 76-day lockdown. Now, in his harrowing new documentary, 76 Days, filmmaker Hao Wu takes us inside four of the city's hospitals to share the gripping stories of patients and frontline workers. And here he is talking with our Hari Srinivasan about those desperate efforts to combat what was then a mysterious illness sweeping through Wuhan. Christian, thanks. Hao Wu, thanks for joining us. There's a scene in the beginning of the film that we want to play of people waiting outside of a door, banging the doors to get into the hospital. Let's take a look. It's almost impossible to think of nurses 
also having to work as crowd control to prevent fights. I mean, people forget this is almost a year ago. It is cold. People have been standing outside. How frustrated were the citizens of Wuhan with the response? At the beginning of the lockdown, the lockdown order came down very suddenly. I think not just people in Wuhan, the rest of the country was also really confused um, because there was very little information going on. And also, people, it, it was really early in the outbreak, and even scientists had very little data about how transmissible, how dangerous this virus was. So th there, there was just widespread panic in the city. Anybody who had any like flu symptoms, they just wanted to rush to the hospital to be checked out, to be admitted, because they, 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 they were fearful they're going to transmit it to their own family as well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, just watching that scene sent chills down my spine as well, even after so many times, just because just the fear, the panic in their voices. But was there a distrust of the government at that time? Because now we know in hindsight and through investigations that there was a discrepancy between the number of people that were getting infected and what the Chinese government was sharing with the outside world, but also in China itself, were people saying, wait, this could be worse than what I'm hearing? I think at the very beginning, because um, only some more commercial publications in China, like Caixin and Sunday, and these kind of big commercial publications, they, they did send, uh, send reporters down to Wuhan to do some investigation. But overall, there hadn't been widespread coverage, uh, especially among the state-owned media. So people were not getting enough information to make, a, you know, to make a, a sound judgment about how bad the situation truly was. So there was a, um, you know, there was just a lot of distrust. They didn't, they didn't know what information was real at that time. Uh, at that time, a lot of people rely on social media, but as we all know, there's a lot of information, misinformation on social media as well. Yeah, so just so I'm clear, the two journalists that you were working with were in China filming all these things and you were in New York. You had just come back from China. And one of the co-directors that you worked on this project with is listed as anonymous. How come? He's a re local photojournalist for a state-owned newspaper. And um, he obviously, because he's a reporter, he could uh, get access to a lot of different hospitals and film there. He filmed the footage primarily just to keep records of what's truly happening, history in the making. Uh, when we started talking about working together on this film, initially he showed great reluctance um, but in the end, I just told him what I wanted to do really want, was to show the humanities that, uh, you know, suffering through this pandemic, trying to help each other to live through, the, through this pandemic. So in the end, I convinced him to collaborate. But still, he was worried about what if what we portray, the way we portray the, uh, the lockdown or the pandemic response, you know, was not well liked, let's say, by the government. Um, also, I think nowadays, more importantly, he worried about any potential backlash on China's internet because there are um, very strong nationalistic uh, patriotic sentiments online that views any negative portrayal of China's response as unpatriotic. You chose to steer clear of the politics in this documentary. Is that for fear of what the government would say? No, it's definitely not out of fear because um, we actually have filmed uh, uh, whistleblower, uh, whistleblower doctors and also we filmed some dissidents who are trying to sue the government um, for, uh, for COVID-19. But I think in the end, it's also a reflection of our own transformation in the, in the way how we think about this pandemic. I remember when, uh, in early April, I was editing in New York when New York was going through its worst. Uh, in the f initial wave of, of COVID-19, uh, hearing siren everywhere, I literally feel like the same Wuhan story in 76 days were being replayed in New York City. So I, I, at that time, I just felt like it was too early to draw, draw any conclusion about any particular government's response, whether it's right or wrong, too draconian or too lenient. So that's part of the reason I decided to shy away from political commentary. That's for another film, maybe two years down the road and looking back and give us the assessment. And secondly, because my two co-director have gathered such powerful, raw, emotional footage on the front line, I, I, I feel like any 
discussion about politics will actually distract the viewers' uh, attention from you know, immersing themselves in these human stories of little kindness towards each other. Well, one of the things I found interesting is that behind these masks, uh, if you just changed the ethnicities of the patients and the doctors, this could have been doctors at Elmhurst Hospital in my neighborhood. It could have been doctors in Houston or in Phoenix um, or in Italy. I mean, the, 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 it's so sad how similar the plight of those uh, workers have been over and over and over again. Absolutely. I was in touch with our, uh, filmmakers in Madrid who are filming uh, hospitals in Madrid and also filmmakers in Milan. And I was here. I started filming in late March here in New York City. I, I have many friends who are doctors in New York hospitals. Uh, yes, the, the same story were being replayed. And I, I think, you know, a lot of times when we talk about COVID-19, about this uh, pandemic, we talk in st statistics and political terms. We keep on forgetting um, behind the statistic and political arguments, there are real human beings and it's the same human stories all over. <laughs> You also chose not to show a lot of death. I mean, there were certainly uh, hints at it, and there were certainly images that we saw in the beginning, but you didn't choose to give us a laundry list of everyone in those hospital wards that had passed. That's right. I think primarily because most of the characters my two collaborators were following, uh, I think the old grandma passed away, but the rest of them, I think they all recovered. There are some side characters they filmed that passed away, but then in the end, because their story didn't make into the, the because, didn't make into the film, so we didn't highlight those deaths. Um, in general, I feel like with this film, it's hard to, um, because we were struggling with some ethical consideration as well during editing. We didn't want to just show death gratuitously. Um, you know, if we want to show death on screen, it has to serve a purpose. I mean, do you find that, you know, this is kind of a, a sensitive decision that a director has to make, but it, it's, the argument also exists that, listen, shielding people from the reality of it gives them more license to ignore that reality. I mean, it's something that the United States is still in. Yeah, I think, I think in China, there are many reasons why Chinese people um, in the end, right, just listen to the government's um, directives and follow the orders. But I think one thing that really contributed to uh, them taking this seriously is the availability of a lot of um, video evidence of how horrible um, this disease, COVID-19 is, um, not only on social media, but also on TV broadcasters. Um, here in the US, I think even now, uh, for different reasons, we still don't have enough. Um, we still are not showing the horrors of COVID-19 to our public to some degrees. And we have, we have read a lot of reporting, but in terms of just being really up close and personal, um, given bare visual evidence, I, th I don't think we have done enough. Your film finds these incredibly small moments of kindness between the patients and the healthcare workers. And you see it over and over again, whether it's taking 
a video of uh, a partner from one room to another so that they can kind of virtually see each other, or it's just holding the hand of a patient who doesn't want to be alone. I mean, that gratitude that you capture, I'm sure it exists here in the United States as well for anybody who's walked out of a hospital. But what's also strange here is that we hear about patients who are, with their dying breath, questioning whether COVID is real and pushing back against their doctors and nurses. Yeah, that's something that is still very bizarre to me. It's after hundreds of thousands of deaths in this country, we, a, a big portion of the population still refuse to accept that COVID-19 is real. That truly baffles me. I, I feel like this country has been so divided and the, the message from the top leadership, the administration, White House administration has been so weak. I think that's maybe partly why we see this kind of resistance to scientific uh, fact about this pandemic. Was there resistance to the lockdown in China? Because what from your film and other places, what we see from these empty streets is that people complied. I mean, what is it, kind of two questions here, what is it about the culture that creates this almost paternalistic relationship with the state and this trust in the state? And two, what about people who wanted to work again and wanted to feed themselves? Weren't they upset? I think at the beginning of the lockdown, because the, as soon as Wuhan was put under official lockdown, the, and, and the rest of China you, you know, basically went into voluntary lockdown. And fortunately, China was, that was the golden you know, Chinese New Year holiday. So people were staying home anyway. Um, but in the very beginning, yes, there was a lot of grumbling in China about uh, the kind of damage to the economy, about uh, the, the measure being too draconian. And, uh, but I think, um, I think there have been reports as well, obviously, in, in not just in, in, in Western media, but also in China, Chinese media about how uh, some local residents were resistant to, to, the, to the tight control that forced them to stay in their apartments and only allowed to go out to get groceries uh, once or twice a week. That was uh, pretty drastic measures the government imposed on, on Wuhan. So there, there was uh, initially some resistance, but by and large, as you said, most people follow the orders. I, I, I think it's not just China, though. If you look at the rest of East Asia, right, Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, and most of the population there follow the government's orders. Um, maybe, I don't know, I'm not a, a historian, but I think as an individual filmmaker, the way I look at it, perhaps it's because of the Confucian culture, because the, 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 the people and the state, it, the relationship is different. You know, it's, uh, the state can be paternalistic and you, 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 sometimes you listen to what the state has to say. And secondly, I think more, maybe more importantly, is in the rest of Asia, there have been so many past outbreaks of viruses, right? Like SARS. Most uh, people in East Asia remember the, 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 the fear of SARS. So as soon as the government tell them, you need to do this in order to stay safe, people immediately put their mask on, people immediately following the orders of sheltering in place. You were in China right before all this happened to visit your grandfather who was ill. Um, he passed away. When do you think you'll be able to go back and find some closure to that? Yeah, I was in, I arrived in Shanghai for Chinese New Year the day Wuhan was put under lockdown. I stayed there for about 10 days and came back. Um, right out, as soon as I came back, I found out my grandpa was diagnosed with late stage liver cancer and he passed away a month later. I wasn't able to go back to say goodbye to him because first of all, it happened really fast. Secondly, there was uh, inbound travel restrictions in China by that point. So I think this kind of guilt sort of guided me during the editing process. That's why I decided to make the part of, part of the reason why the film turned out to be what it is, which is I, when I was editing, I was always looking for that human connection, those little details, because I needed that. I, I feel like I didn't get to say goodbye to my grandpa. And then I was watching all these patients being so scared and alone on, in their hospital bed. 
that was just uh, un unfathomable to me. So, yeah. So I guess in uh, some ways, 76 days is a tribute to my grandpa. And uh, I hope, I really, really hope like coming springtime as vaccine becomes available, I will be able to go, go back to, you know, to visit him in his, um, at his grave and also to see my, uh, my parents. The film is called 76 Days. Hao Wu, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And finally, to Australia for a little good news. Following a devastating summer of bushfires that also destroyed countless species and their habitats, conservationists on Kangaroo Island, which is off southern Australia, worried that little pygmy possums had disappeared forever. But a wildlife group there has found one. Yes, one. It's the world's smallest possum species. The tiny animal weighs in at around seven grams. That's about the weight of a pencil. But this and other rare species are not out of the woods yet, as Australia's bushfire season has arrived early this year. And that's it for our program tonight. Remember, you can follow me and the show on Twitter. Thank you for watching Amanpour and Company on PBS, and join us again tomorrow night.